This talk is on headache and it is high yield for step one, so I've included that icon in some of the key slides. The objectives of this talk are to be able to distinguish between primary headache disorders and other secondary causes of headache. In doing so, you need to recognize red flags for these secondary headache disorders. You also need to understand the pathophysiology of migraine and review the most common headache disorders. The approach in a headache patient is to first determine if this is the first or worst headache that they ha have had. You want to find out if this occurs regularly, and if so, how often, and how long do they last. You want to know when this particular headache began and whether it's similar to prior headaches. If there's a change in the character of headache, this may signify a secondary headache that could even be superimposed on a primary headache disorder. You want to know how the headache started. Was it gradual or sudden? And were there any associated symptoms? You want to know where the pain is located and what the pain feels like. You also want to know if the pain spreads. One question to ask is regarding family history because some headache disorders, especially migraine, will be passed down through the family. On examination, it is important to look at vital signs, especially blood pressure, and to do a full neurological exam on these patients, including a fundoscopic exam. A vascular exam can also be useful for some secondary causes of headache. This is a picture I put together that illustrates the primary and secondary headache disorders. There are three primary headache disorders, migraine, tension headache, and cluster headache. There are several secondary causes of headache, and I have not included all of them here, uh, but these are some of the ones we'll be discussing today. These include giant cell arteritis, meningitis, subarachnoid hemorrhage, and tumor, all of which are uh, concerning causes of headache that need to be diagnosed quickly. Then we have pseudotumor cerebri and intracranial hypotension, and finally sinus and hypertensive headache. Sinus headache will not be covered here, nor will hypertensive headache, which is rare. This is a picture that was drawn by a migraine sufferer. And what it illustrates to us is the desperation that these patients feel when they are in the middle of their migraine. The cause of migraine appears to be polygenetic, which accounts for its variable expression in people and within families. Approximately 80% of migrainers have a first degree relative who have migraine. And you may be more likely to get a family history in patients who have young onset of migraine. Migraine is often misdiagnosed as sinus or tension headache. In this bottom picture here, you can see an illustration of pain that is located over the sinuses. And frequently, sinus headache will um, be associated with pain in these locations. In this other picture, this is also a common location of sinus pain related, uh, or sinus sinusitis that's related to head pain. However, this distribution can also be seen in other headache disorders. The diagnostic criteria for migraine are that the patient has to have at least five attacks lasting four to 72 hours. They have to have at least two of the following, unilateral location, pulsating quality, moderate or severe intensity, and aggravation by physical activity. They also need at least one of the following, nausea and or vomiting, photophobia or phonophobia. With aura, approximately about 20% of migraineurs will have aura, and aura can be almost any neurological symptom that localizes to the central nervous system. However, most frequently, you're gonna hear complaints of visual changes, sensory loss, or speech disturbances. Aura tends to develop over five minutes and last less than one hour. Headache may or may not follow the aura. Some patients will have aura without head pain. If head pain does occur, it typically follows the aura within one hour. So on the upper right here, you can see a picture of what a migraine or described as a visual aura prior to their headache. It's also called a, a scintillating scotoma. This type of field cut, especially if it's moving or flashing, is characteristic of migraine headaches. In some of the classrooms yesterday, I told the groups that I am a migraine sufferer and that one of my migraines was preceded by a homonymous hemanopia. So I was driving and had blurred vision when I pulled over and tested my visual fields, I had knocked out the left side of my visual field in both eyes. The aura lasted approximately 20 minutes and then resolved completely, followed by just minor head pain afterwards. 
Because I had head pain afterwards, it was clear to me that this was a migraine rather than a secondary or more concerning cause of headache. Now, I would also like to tell you about my migraine history briefly. So I was free from headache until I took step one when I was a medical student and I had my first migraine during step one. So although I felt that step one was going quite well, I became uh, somewhat nauseated in the middle of the test. And during the break, I got up and um, I actually vomited. When I went back to my seat, approximately 20 minutes later, I started to have unilateral throbbing pain. And I, although I thought it was quite interesting that I was suffering my first migraine, and I knew it was migraine because it ran in my family, it was quite unfortunate it happened during step one. Hopefully this will not happen to you. So what is the etiology of pain and migraine? So it appears that there's activation of the central nervous system, and there may be dysfunction of brainstem pain and vascular control centers. As a reminder, pain perception is localized to the anterior cingulate cortex, and the migraine generator of pain appears to be a combination of information coming from the Raphe nucleus, the locus cerulis, and the periaqueductal gray. We also know that irritation of local structures are responsible for migraine. You can have irritation of cranial nerve 5, of the meninges, of the blood vessels, and when this occurs, you will have release of several substances, including substance P, calcitonin gene-related peptide, and vasoactive peptides. Tension headache is the second primary cause of headache, and it's the most common form of headache. These medications often respond to over-the-counter medication, and they rarely require medical attention. On the right is a picture of a patient that shows the distribution of tension headache. It can be in the frontal lobe or in the occipital lobe, although you can have a tension headache pattern in almost any location. Many patients with tension headache will also have a history of migraine headache. These may be short or long lasting. They tend to be more than 30 minutes. Patients will have bilateral steady pain and it can be a chronic problem or it can be a consequence of medication overuse. So what happens with medication overuse is that if you regularly use over-the-counter medications, your brain will become used to having them, essentially, because of changes in regulation of the neurotransmitters. When you try to pull those medications away after you've been using them regularly, the brain will respond by uh, causing a recurrence of headache. This can become quite problematic and it puts patient in a patients in a cycle where they're using more and more over-the-counter medications. This can also happen when narcotics are used for head pain, and thus we generally tell our patients not to use non-steroidals or narcotics for head pain, especially more than a day or two in a row. I will tell you too that medication overuse syndrome uh, as a cause of headache is very hard to treat because you have to wean patients off of all of their over-the-counters in order to fix this problem. And unfortunately, in the current climate, we're unable to admit patients to the hospital to do this. So this can be uh, quite a serious problem in the clinic. Cluster headache is our third uh, primary cause of headache, and it is the most painful of the primary headaches. These patients have severe unilateral orbital, supraorbital, or temporal pain, and it's associated with conjunctival injection, eyelid edema, forehead sweating, and meiosis. Patients will describe a boring or knife-like pain lasting 15 to 180 minutes, and they will frequently have more than eight daily. Cluster headaches cluster over periods of weeks to months followed by periods of remission. Drinking alcohol often precipitates attacks, and these patients can feel restless or agitated, and they will often pace. This behavior is opposite the behavior we see in migraines, Migraine patients tend to go into a dark room because they are phonophobic and photophobic, a dark, quiet room, and they tend to go to sleep. Cluster headache patients are exactly the opposite. They have this kind of agitation, and so they pace around and they move, and this almost distracts them from their pain. Nausea and vomiting is uncommon with cluster headaches, and the, the, the pain that we see in cluster headaches is different in nature to that that we see with trigeminal neuralgia. So as you may recall with trigeminal neuralgia, you will have repetitive unilateral shooting pain in the distribution of cranial nerve 5 that can last for less than one minute. This is very different than what we see in cluster headaches 
which is located um, typically around or behind the eye, and it has a much different temporal quality to it. Here's a picture at the bottom that just reminds us that you can have conjunctival injection. And um, here again is the location that these patients tend to have pain. Now some patients with cluster headache will report it as so severe that they want to commit suicide or jump out of a window during these episodes of pain. So this particular disorder is something that you want to treat aggressively. So I just want to comment about epidemiology and we'll discuss the epidemiology of migraine because it's the most likely uh, primary headache disorder that you'll be treating in the clinic. So migraine is the most common cause of disabling headache of the primary headache disorders and approximately 28 million migraine sufferers uh, are in the U.S. Mostly women, but men get this as well. Nearly one in four households has at least one migraine sufferer and the migraine prevalence peaks between 25 and 55 years. The first attack tends to occur in patients teens or 20s and it is uncommon to have first attack after the age of 40. So if this is part of the history, you wanna actually look for secondary causes of headache. Migraine will typically remit or improve dramatically during menopause. Let's talk about red flags for secondary headache disorders. If the patient reports a sudden onset of headache and it is the worst headache of their life, you will be concerned about headache disorders such as subarachnoid hemorrhage. If patients have an increasing frequency or severity of headaches, you may worry about other mass lesions such as tumors. An older age of first presentation is unusual for the primary headache disorders, so you would look for a secondary cause. A headache caused by Valsalva maneuver such as coughing, sneezing, or straining may signify that you have a mass or another lesion within the brain causing the headache. If the headache wakes you up from sleep, this is not typical of primary headache disorders and you would need to look for secondary causes. Finally, if there's a history of HIV, cancer, or head injury, you want to again look for a mass lesion. Concerning exam findings for secondary headache disorders include fever, neck stiffness, and rash and these would be associated with meningitis. Focal neurological findings would tell you that you may have a mass lesion. An altered mental status is going to suggest a more severe cause of headache than a primary headache disorder. Meningitis, it presents with a headache that is generalized and can be pulsatile. It can be associated with nausea and photophobia, and it escalates rapidly. The key for meningitis is that there will be prominent neck stiffness, especially with flexion. And in many cases, you are unable, if the patient is laying flat, to lift the head off of the bed, even if the patient has a change in consciousness. Fever is prominent in this disorder. So this is a picture on the bottom right of a patient with a Neisseria meningitis, and some of these patients will have skin abnormalities to give you clues to etiology. Subarachnoid hemorrhage we have covered already and is frequently due to an aneurysm rupture. You will have a sudden onset of intense pain described as a thunderclap or worse headache of the patient's life. And it can be associated with photophobia, neck stiffness, and encephalopathy. The bottom right is this picture showing this bright blood located in the subarachnoid space. Brain tumors are frequently associated with headache and it's the headache that will wake a person from sleep or improve as the day progresses. This type of headache disorder is progressive and it worsens as the tumor increases in size. This type of headache is more often seen in people with prior headache history. Uh, so if you have a patient who has a primary headache disorder that's been followed for quite some time, but they tell you that the headache pattern has changed, it is now waking them up from sleep or getting better as the day goes on, you would need to go ahead and inch them to look for a secondary problem. Idiopathic intracranial hypertension or pseudotumor cerebri is a headache disorder that typically occurs in young women who, are, who may or may not be obese. There are several medications that increase the risk of developing pseudotumor cerebri, including an excess of vitamin E, danazole, or tetracycline. These headaches are characterized by pain upon awakening and can be associated with double vision or pulsatile tinnitus. Diagnostically, you would see an elevated opening pressure on spinal tap 
but have normal imaging. It is unclear what the underlying etiology of this disorder, but because you have an elevated opening pressure, it is called pseudotumor. The neuro exam is non-focal, with the exception of papilledema, which is secondary to the increased intracranial pressure. And because of this pressure on the optic chiasm and optic nerves, you can lose vision in this disorder. This disorder needs to be recognized because the loss of vision can be permanent, and again, this disorder occurs in younger individuals. Weight loss can help if the individual is obese, and there are some medications we use, such as acetazolamide and topiramate. If the disorder remains refractory despite oral medications, the patient can have repeat lumbar punctures, CSF shunt placement, or optic nerve sheath fenestration surgery in order to save the vision. Intracranial hypertension or post-LP headache is a low pressure headache that is usually caused following a lumbar puncture where there's a tear in the dura. It is sometimes unclear who will develop this side effect of a lumbar puncture. So we typically tell patients about this when we're consenting them for the procedure. The pain appears generalized and diffuse, but can be dull and throbbing in nature. And it always gets worse or appears when they're standing. The patient's pain will resolve when they're laying flat. So this particular headache, although it may be um, difficult in isolation to diagnose, always comes with a history of a recent lumbar puncture. Now the reason I have a Diet Coke here is that one of the treatments for a post-LP headache is caffeine. So I will actually have my patients drink caffeine prior to the procedure in order to reduce the headache afterwards. Although there is not good data to suggest that this is helpful, uh, it is a benign way that we can try to prevent the symptoms. Giacal arteritis is a secondary headache disorder that occurs in patients over the age of 55. Patients will present with pain and tenderness over the scalp. They may also have fatigue, low-grade fever, or weight loss. This is a systemic illness that affects the medium-sized arteries, and essentially you have inflammation of the artery. Giant cell arteritis is when you have an inflamed temporal artery, and because of the distribution of blood supply, you can lose vision if misdiagnosed. The way we diagnose this disorder is by taking a biopsy of the temporal artery and looking for inflammation. Again, you want to diagnose this and treat the arteritis, usually with steroids, in order to save vision long term. In summary, primary headache disorders should be distinguished from secondary causes of headaches. Cluster, tension, and migraine headaches are primary headache disorders that are distinguished by their distribution, by their pain quality, and their temporal qualities as well. Intracranial hypotension and giant cell arteritis are secondary headache disorders that can cause a loss of vision and should be recognized early. And of course, you want to make sure you're looking for red flags so you don't miss a mass lesion or other cause of headache.